Today's scripture reading is from the book of 1 John in the New Testament, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. This is God's word. Good morning. After World War II, you may know probably that um, the country of Korea was split in two at the 38th parallel. But there were still communist sympathizers that lived in the South. And in the South, there was a pastor named Son Yang Wan. He and his family lived in a province in South Korea. They actually lived with and ministered to a leper colony. One afternoon, when Pastor Son and his wife were not there with his children, a gang of kids came to the house to taunt the oldest son because he had become friends with an American soldier. The oldest son went outside to defend himself. His younger brother came with him, but they were quickly overwhelmed and overcome because this gang of kids was bent on violence. They beat them. They killed them. Government soldiers came to the little colony the next day to establish order. They arrested a young man, a boy, named Chai Sun, who admitted to killing Pastor Son's two sons. Pastor Son received news of this when he was grieving for his two boys. He responded to the authorities and asked that Chai Sun not be murdered, not be executed, for the crime that he had committed, instead that he be released to him, not to punish him, but to adopt him as his own son. His 13-year-old daughter even testified to support her father's request. Love is reckless. Love is wild. We just sang about it. Chai Sun would enter the family. He quickly became a Christian after hearing of God's love. He even went to seminary and became a pastor too. And these words are recorded by Pastor Son. I thank God that he has given me the love to adopt as my son the enemy who killed my dear boys. Perfect Love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in God's love. This is what we have to try to get our heads around today. The gigantic, massive, preposterously ridiculous paradigm of God's love. John says twice in the passage Nene just read, God is love. In the same letter, John writes that God is spirit. God is light. So love is not all that God is. 
The author of Hebrews says God is a consuming fire. Jesus said that no one is good but God alone, so God is good. The prophet Zephaniah proclaimed that God is a mighty warrior, and Jeremiah wrote that God is a God of retribution. So what does God is love mean? God is love means that all actions, all of God's actions all the time are loving despite whatever overwhelming amount of evidence in your life right now runs counter to the claim. God is love all the time. All the time, you're supposed to say God is love. (laughs) God is love all the time. All the time. Thank you. We're going to chop this text up because, meaning, I'm not going to step through it verse by verse. That's normally what we do. But John is very circular in his logic. We're in the middle of a sermon series right now. So instead of going verse by verse, we're going to hop all over the place. We're in a sermon series that probably 50% of churches are in called the 2020 Vision. (laughs) Um, (laughs) God, joking with Leo about that. It's essentially about God is love. Today, the community of love. Love is essential. Love is sacrificial. And love will save the world. Love is essential. Dear friends, let us love one another. Dear friends... Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We love because he first loved us. In the span of these verses, love in the form of agape, so it's always agape is the root, occurs 25 times. Vertically, 14 times, meaning God's love for us. Even that phrase, dear friends, is a form of agape that means beloved. Beloved love. Vertical, horizontal, it occurs 11 times. What God has joined together, let no man separate. To receive the love of God truly is for the love of God to pour out of you. You can't separate them, but you also have to keep them in the right order. Horizontal love between one another is always a response to vertical love. To the extent, in fact, that if horizontal love does not exist, then vertical love is absent because you can't give away what you don't possess. So if you're struggling to love, think about somebody you're struggling to love right now. The answer is not to try to love them better. The answer is to trust that God loves you even more. Thomas Merton, the root of Christian love is not the will to love, but the faith that one is loved. You see, the gospel is not love others so that God will love you. The gospel is love others because God has already loved you. Under this point, love is essential. There are two stinging applications The first is this, you cannot be in a relationship with God without becoming a loving person. You cannot be in a relationship with God. You are not in a relationship with God if you are not slowly becoming a more loving person. In other words, there's no such thing as an unloving child of God. It's right here in the text. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. That's stinging application number one. Stinging application number two is that conversely, You can be a loving person, but not be in relationship with God. Whoa. 
I, I know a lot of people who are not believers in Jesus that are a lot more kind and patient, and that's what Paul says love is, than people that I know who are believers, like top of the list is myself. <laughs> in order to love as God does, you must become a child of God, which means you must believe in Jesus. John is clear about this too. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, then God lives in them through the power of the Holy Spirit, and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. In other words, there's no love within us except for the love God has for us. He goes on to say, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again. It happens through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, Greek word pneuma, is like wind. That's what it means, wind, and it blows wherever it pleases. As a pastor, I have no control how the wind is blowing right now. And I'm not talking about the AC. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. He blows wherever he pleases. And if he blows into your heart, then you are in God and God is in you. And now you can love because belief has come first, notice, and we have seen and testify. We believe that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. In order to love the way God loves, you must rely on the love God has for you, not your love for others. It'll never be enough. But the only way to do this is through the, the Spirit. Him and us, us and Him. And it requires belief. What I'm driving at is that love flows from belief, and belief is a gift of God that comes from the Spirit. So you can, in some way, shape, or form, be loving, even if you are not a follower of God and Jesus Christ, but you can't go all the way. You can't love as God does. Belief in Jesus as the Son of God and Savior of sinners is required to love others the way God loves us. Now, that's very hard to accept if you're not a follower of Jesus. I get that. Would you open yourself up to humbly engage with why I think that's hard for you to accept if you're not a follower of Jesus by considering this quote from David Bentley Hart. Even the most ardent secularists among us generally cling to notions of human rights economic and social justice, providence for the indigent or poor, legal equality or basic human dignity, here's where you have to really start paying attention, that pre-Christian Western culture would have found not so much foolish as unintelligible. It is simply the case that we would not be able to believe in any of these things. They would never have even occurred to us had our ancestors not believed, as John says, that God is love, that charity is the foundation of all virtue, that all of us are equal before the eyes of God, that to fail to feed the hungry or care for the suffering is to sin against Christ. Do you see what Hart is saying? Here's what he's saying. There is no reason to love the lost, the least, the locked up, the left behind. There's no reason to pursue racial, social, economic justice. No reason to demand equality and civil rights or declare that all human beings are dignified and deserving of respect. These convictions would have never occurred to us if God, who is love, had not burst onto the scene of history as the Son of God. If God, who is love, had not broken into this broken world as the person of Jesus Christ, we wouldn't have even thought of it. Jesus brought these things to us. So if you assume them, then you're actually more of a believer in Jesus than you realize. And it is that belief that inspires our love for those armchair theologians, belief 
Faith and love are the evidence that one is a child of God. Yes, we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone, but, and this is what Calvin says if you need a good Reformed theologian to convince you, faith, true faith, is never, ever alone. Love always follows because there's no such thing as an unloving child of God. Okay, that was pretty theoretical, theological. Let's get into the weeds of practical application. Kurt Thompson, does anybody know him? Wrote The Soul of Shame and a great book called Anatomy of the Soul. He was speaking here in Houston last Sunday at a different church, The Story, which I've heard great things about. Love that Houston has so many wonderful churches. He has an exercise in the book, Anatomy of the Soul, and at the end of it, I just wrote, WOW, in all caps, exclamation, multiple exclamation points. Here's how I would describe this exercise, and I'm gonna read it to you pretty verbatim. It's a really long quote, which in preaching class, they tell you to never do, but I don't think you'll have a problem tracking with it. This is an exercise in what I would call belief in Jesus and communal love. It's an exercise in being less conviction averse. See, some of us are conviction averse. We come to church and we don't want to be convicted. I have a good friend who says, when I come to church, Link, I kind of want to get my bleep kicked. Are you conviction averse or do you welcome it? The Bible says to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. The Bible also says perfect love drives out fear. But in order to drive it out, you got to feel it. This is an exercise, especially to the followers of Jesus in the room. This is an exercise where if you were to do it, you'd actually start to practice what you preach. Here we go. Ready? Choose two or three people whom you trust with whom you have frequent interaction. People who have the real, though not necessarily intended likelihood of hurting you because of the amount of time you spend together. That's a great sentence. As a group, commit to do the following. Anytime a member of the group commits an action, commits an action, any action, a thought, a word, a deed, against another member of the group. Aaron was talking about gossip leading up to the prayer of confession. This would be perfect for that situation. He or she is to confess this without exception, no matter how large or small the offense may be, to the offended party as soon as possible. The offended party is then to, without exception, offer forgiveness with all the properly attended nonverbal reinforcement. <laughs> What? This guy's brilliant. Commit to do this for at least six weeks and then review the process. Reflect on how your relationships have changed and stayed the same. There will be varied reactions to this invitation. Like, won't I just hurt the other person's feelings when I tell them what I've been saying or thinking about them? Yes. If your intention is to let the person know what you think about him or her, but confession is about admitting where you have lost your mind, not where the other person has. <laughs> Rich. There are countless other objections, but consider how much emotional burden we carry in all our unconfessed sin. Consider how much more we bear given our unresolved hurt much of which we hardly even notice anymore. Imagine what our lives would be like if all the weight were to fall away. Imagine the creativity that might be unleashed if there really is no fear of making mistakes. Since when you do, confession and forgiveness are the rule, not the exception. This, my friends, he concludes, is the kingdom of God on display. This exercise takes a great deal of courage. I invite you to try it. I believe you will find that it changes your life forever. We have city groups and we have focus groups. Anybody want to spin off a courage group? Love is essential. Love is also sacrificial. 
John writes, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then later, this is how love is made complete among us. In this world, we are like Jesus. Let that percolate in your heart for a little bit. God loved us by sending his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And in this world, we are supposed to be like him. A sacrifice, dying, losing on purpose. Miroslav Volf, we may believe in Jesus, but we do not believe in his ideas. Ooh. We believe in Jesus as the atoning sacrifice for our sins, but I'm not too comfortable with the idea of doing what Pastor Son did. Doesn't sound very wise. Well, the Apostle Paul said love is patient and love is kind. He didn't say anything about it being wise. In fact, in chapter 1 of the very letter that he penned those words, he said the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. Is the reckless love you're willing to receive only the kind you're willing to receive? Or are you willing to recklessly share it wildly, sacrificially? Brian Zond, pastor who quoted Wolf in his book, writes, When we see Christ dead upon the cross, we discover a God who would rather die than kill his enemies. That's a bomb. He'd rather die than kill his enemy. We don't even do this on Twitter. I find an enemy on social media, down they go. I'd rather die. I'm killing my enemy, assassinating him with words. We forget all of this because the disturbing truth is it's hard to believe in Jesus. When I say it's hard to believe in Jesus, I mean it's hard to believe in Jesus' ideas, in his way of saving the world. His way, Paul writes in Romans 5, is that while we were still sinners, while we were God's enemies, Christ died. Is Jesus just an atoning sacrifice for your sins? Or do you get excited about saving the world with him by taking up your cross, dying, and being like him? Martin Luther King Jr., love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. He's talking about Christ-like love. Christ-like love is sacrificial. It is not at all for the benefit of self. It is entirely for the benefit of somebody else. Christ-like love is not flowery words. This text, 1 John 4, you can kind of read it in this soft, flowery line. We love because he first loved us. No, it's not a calligraphy verse. Because love is not flowery language. It's actions that fight, but not violently. And that's why MLK was so Christ-like. Nonviolent resistance for the sake of justice, sometimes losing on purpose. It's all on behalf of the beloved, and it's especially on behalf of the beloved when the beloved is not acting very lovable. Now, you can apply that in your marriages and in your parenting and in your workplace and all over the place. Christ-like love pays the price, takes the hit, meets the conditions that the beloved could never meet. 
so that the beloved can be and remain beloved. Christ-like love is death. It's death to self for the life of somebody else. I forgot to ask permission from my oldest two daughters to tell this story, so I might have to ask their forgiveness later. When they were little, this was before Rachel was on the scene. Ellie was five, I think. Julia was two and a half. We had to implement a rule at dinner time called vegetables first. I told the Montrose City Groups this story, so Montrose City Groups, y'all can tune out for a little bit if you want to. Uh, vegetables first, of course, was in order to get the good stuff, you had to first take care of the bad stuff. <laughs> you had to eat your green beans or your lima beans or your broccoli in order to get whatever chicken, pasta, or this particular night, pizza. We were having broccoli and pizza. So I'm sitting, well, Katie is at the oven. The pizza wasn't done yet. I got a five-year-old and a two-and-a-half-year-old on my right and left. They've each got a plate of broccoli. Now, Julia at the time actually loved vegetables. The vegetables first rule was not for Julia. It was for Ellie. She did not like vegetables. So to make matters even worse, we're not long into this before Julia's completely finished with her broccoli and Katie's bringing over two slices of gooey cheese pizza. And Ellie's just sitting there sulking, upset. She doesn't want to eat her broccoli. Come on, hon, you got this. <laughs> Revert to coach mode. <laughs> you can do this. Just don't want it. Want pizza? Katie was, we were tag teaming. She was at the sink or I was <laughs> parenting. And I don't know what came over me. I believe it was the Holy Spirit. I grabbed one of Ellie's broccoli trees, that's what we called them, and I popped it in my mouth, chewed it up and swallowed it. She kind of looked at me, kind of curious. So I grabbed another one, ate it, grabbed another one, ate the whole plate of broccoli, even gathered up all the little, you know, those little broccoli shavings, <laughs> popped those in the mouth. I said, hey, Kate, Ellie's done with her broccoli. That's the gospel right there, my friends. Jesus ate our broccoli, and he gives us pizza. And I used to, I've told this story many times, thank you for laughing. And I usually end it right there, but now I would add this. Whose broccoli are you eating? Who are you making a way for to enjoy the is Jesus just an atoning sacrifice for your sins, or are you so wrapped up in his sacrificial love for you that you can't help but make sacrifices for others that they might live? Sacrificial, essential love, all the conditions. It's not just undeserved, it's ill-deserved. Finally, love will save the world. Love is essential, love is sacrificial, love will save the world. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent the son to be the savior of the world. And then again, this is, we've already done this one, but it bears repeating, to connect it to 14. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. What would it look like for God's love to reach completion at City Church? Here's what it would look like. We share it with each other and we share it with the world. We try to out-sacrifice each other even when it's not deserved. You gossip against somebody, you go tell them. Gossip's the funniest thing. I've been a pastor forever. I've never had that sin confessed to me. We're all doing it. Greed is the other one. The Father sent Jesus to save the world. And in this world that he's still saving we are to be like Jesus. You see, God created each of you, each and every single one of you, to reflect his image. And God has saved you to help him save the world.
Salvation is not from the world. It's to the world. Brian Zond again, I don't have a quote slide for this, but listen, if Jesus saves the world gets reduced to save people go to heaven when they die, then Jesus is simply the one who saves us from the world, not the Savior of the world. But this is not what John meant when he spoke of Jesus as the Savior of the world. John was talking about something much bigger and much more expansive. This is the gospel, a vision for the future that is redemptive, not destructive, one that anticipates new Jerusalem and is not obsessed with Armageddon. Final story, and I I did some digging, and I told this like, three and a half years ago, so many of you haven't heard it. I have a friend named Ted. It's a long time ago. He's also a pastor. He bought an old fixer-up house, and they had to take it down to the studs. He, his dad's a general contractor, and he's, he's really good at these sorts of things. So for the demolition phase of the project, he invited some family and friends over to help him with the demo. His brother-in-law brought his four-year-old son, Jake, he sees Jake. This is demo day. He's like, oh, man, what am I, where am I going to do with Jake? He's four. But Jake had a little, you know, a little play school tool belt. He, he was ready to go. So they were going to start downstairs. It had an upstairs. So Ted takes little Jake, who's his nephew, takes Jake upstairs. He gets a chalk line out. He makes like a one-by-one one or two-by-two two chalk square. And he grabs Jake's little hammer from his play school belt, and he hands it to Jake, and he says, I want you to go after that square, man. I want you to just get after it. We're going to be downstairs, demolition, and you're going to start it up here. Jake's pumped. (laughs) Jake grabs his hammer. Ted walks down and says, okay, that'll keep him occupied for a little while. Hours go by, and Ted completely forgets about Jake. They get to lunchtime. Ted remembers, starts walking up the stairs, and he hears this very bully. (laughs) And there's Jake, blisters on his hands, but, hey, Jake, you tired? Yeah, and of course, he hasn't even made a hole in the drywall. His brother-in-law had come up with him. Come on, Jake, let's go home. You worked hard today, so they, they go on home. The next day at church, Sunday morning, his brother-in-law and Jake went to the same church. It's after the service, and Ted is within earshot of Jake and a few of his other little four-year-old buddies, and they're talking, and he hears one of them say, hey, Jake, what'd you do this weekend? Jake goes, I helped my Uncle Ted build his house. (laughs) Jesus has called you to help him save the world, to build his house. It's a salvation project. It's a redemptive project. Now, you may feel sometimes like all you have is a little plastic hammer and you're hitting on a one-inch square chalk-lined piece of drywall. But what Jesus is here to tell us this morning, hear this, Jesus is here to tell you, I made the essential sacrifice of love to save you. Now, how are you going to respond in love to join me so together we can save the world? It's so much more than about your soul going to heaven. It's about the perfect love of Jesus driving away all fear right now because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect with the love of God. Jesus, drive away all fear, all anxiety, all worry. Give us a creative and lasting vision for how in this world, Jesus, we can be like you. We thank you and celebrate the atoning sacrifice for sin that you made once and for all upon the cross. We acknowledge that you said to us, Take up your cross now and follow me daily. Join me in saving the world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.